What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the No Rain, No Rainbows podcast. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate you taking the time to listen to yet another episode of this wonderful podcast, if I must say so myself. Shout out to my executive producer, Andre Suttles, as always, for helping to make this podcast possible. Subtle Solution Media, always having our back here on the No Rain, No Rainbows podcast. And I'm excited. I've been looking forward to this interview for, for quite some time. We have co-founder and CEO of Marketplace Superheroes from across the pond, out of the UK, Stephen Summers joining us today. And Stephen, we set up this meeting a, a few months ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I failed you miserably, Ted. I, I kept you waiting, but hopefully the wait will be worth it today. That's the goal. Yeah, I, I have no doubt, and you have not failed me at all. Patience is a virtue, and I'm a very patient <laughs> man, as a lot of our listeners probably know. But um, for anyone who might not has not been introduced to your content on YouTube and some of the work that you do, I'd love to give you a, a, an opportunity to introduce yourself really quick before we jump sure. into today's subject. Sure. Well, first of all, Ted, you have such a smooth voice. I kind of was a little bit hypnotized <laughs> as you were doing my intro there. So <laughs> I'm going to forget what I'm talking about as we go forward today. We'll have to see. Yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, so my who, who am I? My name is Stephen Summers, as you mentioned, and I am the co-founder of Marketplace Superheroes. Uh, we teach people all over the world how to sell their own branded products globally on Amazon. And we've been doing that now. I've been selling on Amazon now for 11 years We've been actually teaching Amazon for uh, almost uh, about six years now. But in that time that we built up Marketplace Superheroes, we have over 8,200 students now, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people who started from scratch and have built up their Amazon businesses. But the really cool thing that separates us, I think, from everybody else in this space and something we can talk a lot about today from a business perspective is we actually are not just a course anymore. We created a freight company about two and a half years ago now called Superhero Freight. Mm -hmm. Everything we do is superheroes. I make no apologies for that whatsoever. <laughs> and uh, we actually are going to ship about 8 million units this year from China to the U.S., we have a big warehouse there in Houston. Uh, we've got a warehouse in the UK, in Northern Ireland. We've got a warehouse in Australia and in Canada as well that we control ourselves. And so that's really a big difference in this space that a lot of people maybe are just a course, but in order to be successful on Amazon, especially when you are private labeling, selling your own branded stuff, you really need like a logistics network and partners and stuff like that. And so that's what we've been building. And our community is, it's great because people stick with us for the long term. And the more successful that they are with our education, the more they ship, therefore, the more we like move on together and build a pretty cool partnership. So that's pretty much what, who we are. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And, and my mind starts running wild with the whole freight company <laughs> thing. And you talk about logistics and when you're shipping products across the ocean, the last thing you need is a shipping container full of your products being on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. So it's great <laughs> that you're starting to hold on to those logistics. And, and it's amazing because I, what I love doing in this podcast is, is kind of taking us back a little bit because sure. after the guest introduces themselves, a lot of times the audience is going to say, okay, wow, that's amazing. But understanding the bridge of the gap from, from where you are now to where it all started can yeah. really help build that roadmap for folks. So I'd love to hear about maybe the Steven we don't get to see uh, in sure. the courses or the Steven that we haven't been able to meet. What sure. happened maybe, uh, you mentioned 11 years in the space before yeah. you kind of started selling. What was Steven like back then and, and how did the inception of the business come in? Come into play. Sure, yeah. Well, um, you know, I wanted to be a rock star back in the day, right? And uh, so I didn't do that. You might have guessed, but I'm, I'm over it now. But that's <laughs> when I was in my teens, I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to play in bands. So I was playing music and I didn't really know anything other than that that I wanted to do with my life. It was all about music for me. And when I was about 19, I left my hometown uh, called Wexford in Ireland and uh, I moved up to Dublin, which is the, the capital city. And basically, uh, I pursued music for a number of years and I was working as a data processor, which is the most boring job in the world, by the way, for anybody who doesn't know that, uh, while I was doing that. It was really just a way to pay my way through playing music. And so um, my parents were like, well, look, you can't just play music. You have to get something to, you know, fall back on. A lot of our parents told us mm -hmm. that, right? And, and they loved me and, loved, and they want to take care of me. I get all that. So I said, well, look, I'll study business because I don't really know what else I want to do. So I did three years of business. I actually got student of the year in my second year, which was pretty cool. Uh, I never finished my degree because 
By the time I got to the end of my third year, I'd been in the band for a few years. And at that time, the band had broken up. So I was in my kind of early 20s, very early 20s. And I was like, I don't want to continue with college, but I want to get into business. So I did what a lot of us did, probably yourself included, Ted, at some point in your life, Googled how to make money online. And for anybody who's ever Googled that, you will know you get a lot of weird stuff. You get some mm-hmm. stuff that's okay. You get a lot of stuff that's, let's face it, pretty scammy. And so I just had this opinion that everything on the internet's a complete scam. It's all nonsense and all of that. And I said, well, what's a business then that isn't nonsense and is real and is something I can feel good about. And for me, just selling physical products on Amazon made a lot of sense to me because it was a great business to be in. I could learn how, you know, profit margins work and how uh, fulfillment works and all this kind of stuff. And also I could feel good about it. You know, it wasn't some opportunity that I had to tell my friends about who were all going to fall out with me or my parents or whatever. And so it just made a lot of logical sense. And I tried buying a lot of courses in the space and tried, I thought I was going to do drop shipping and all these random things. And I didn't really do anything for about two years. And so when I was almost 23 years old, at this point in time, I was extremely fat and lazy, unfortunately, uh, because I just felt directionless. And I started asking around, like, look, who can help me? Because until then, I'd never asked anybody. I was just trying to do it all on my own, trying to find information. And courses weren't as good as they are nowadays, really. But anyway, uh, my aunt in Northern Ireland, uh, which is part of the UK, which is where the confusion is. So when you say UK, I don't take it personally. You're, you're right in many ways. So don't worry about that. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> uh, so, so I lived there for a long time. And our company's in the UK. So you're, you're right in many ways, right? Uh, so, so my aunt called me and she said, I've got this friend called Robert. Would you like to meet him? He sells stuff on Amazon and eBay. I could not believe my looks. So I said, absolutely. Introduce me to this man. So I meet this guy. We go for a night out in Dublin. I had no money. I was totally broke. They paid for everything. And he's like six foot two, big beard, drinking loads of beer. And I was just like, this guy's a, an interesting mentor, but you know, he sounds like he's going to be able to help me. And uh, to Robert's credit, he was incredible. He is incredibly intelligent. And to, I was just fortunate that he just gave me a shot. He said, look, come up and hang out in the warehouse for a week. See what you think. I took a week's vacation. I went up there. It was freezing cold. There were a couple of rats running around in the warehouse, but I instantly fell in love with it because there were real products being sold to real people. It just felt like, yes, this is a business. I can learn this and I can do something with this. So I quit my job. I moved in with my aunt into her spare room and I started working in the warehouse. I worked there for nine months. I didn't get paid anything. I worked for free. Uh, but during that time, I started selling some of Robert's products that were like secondhand or whatever on eBay and started teaching myself about HTML and CSS so I could make nicer listings on eBay, teaching myself some copywriting, all that jazz. And I just started getting better and better at all of that because I had tried to sell a product on Amazon bef- just before I met Robert and I got my money back, but I wasn't very successful. And that's what really pushed me to find a mentor. And so uh, anyway, I'm working there for nine months. And at the end of that, Robert and I get to know each other really well. We're become best friends. And we just, we just looked at Robert's business and we said, you know, this is really old fashioned. We should just sell our own products on Amazon, but all across the world. We only sold in the UK at that time. And so we also said these products we're selling, they're a bit saturated, they're a bit too competitive. Let's just sell all different kinds of products. And so we did that. And uh, we worked just the two of us. We got rid of the two warehouses he had at the time. He had staff. We got rid of everybody. And we went all in on Amazon in multiple countries. And it took us about 18 months to build the business back up from, from scratch. Uh, but we did. And we got it to doing the best part of $2 million in revenue a year at about a 30% net profit margin, which was nice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we started traveling, going to Disney with our families and all this. And it was, it was a nice rhythm of life. But really then 2014, after doing it for a couple of years, people started asking us like, how are you two weirdos like traveling around and you got a business going, what are you doing? Yeah. So we started showing people who we knew and then word spread. And then we, we brought our program online and it grew from there, which we can get into obviously, but that's, that was the beginning to the start of Marketplace Superheroes. Yeah. And, and correct, just correct me if I'm wrong, Robert Ricky, your current business partner, yeah, that's, that's the, business the same partner. Robert. That's the same Robert. Yes, he gave me my shot in business and he's still my business partner to this day. That's amazing because I I really want to make sure our listeners 
and, and, and our watchers on YouTube can kind of really pull in what happened with your story. Because mm -hmm. I wrote down at one point, you, you looked at how do I make money online? I think a lot of us have looked at that. And yeah. we talk about here in No Rain, No Rainbows, having multiple streams of income and, and establishing a life where we're not just chained to a nine to five and we can have a life by design. And that comes with revenue streams. So you looked that up, but then you felt directionless at some point. And it wasn't until finding a mentor, someone to kind of take you along the way that was helpful. But the main thing that, that you said that I really touched on was when you, you started working for free. Mm -hmm. So many people, um, they say, hey, I know my value. Uh, no, no one's paying me my value. But you haven't done anything yet. <laughs> but you, very limited value. Exactly. Yes. It's like, yes, listen, you are valuable. Anyone that's listening, there's a lot of value within you, but you have sure. to water it and grow it and you have to produce it into the plant. Just like a, yeah. a seed has the plant within it, but it's not a yeah. seed yet. You don't get the fruit until it's watered. So you yeah. went through that whole process and you've watered it and and you're you're finding success. 2014, other people say, hey, spread the love. How do you do this? My question in this whole journey is where does yeah. the fear set in? Where does the reality of I'm, I just left a job, I'm working for free. How do I make money if this doesn't pan out? Like, yeah. Where did the fear come from? Yeah, I was fortunate in some ways because I was 23. I'm almost 34 now. And uh, I didn't, like I, I lived with my aunt, right? And so I didn't have like rent or anything. She was very good to me in that way. So I was fortunate in some ways. However, uh, and, and my aunt was fantastic in this whole time, but you know, she didn't want a dude who was 23 living with her forever, right? So after about nine months, she kind of said, it would be cool if you could, if you could move, uh, that would be great, which I totally appreciated. So that was the moment where I had, a bit, a good bit of fear because we were not making very much money then because we were just beginning to rebuild things, Robert and I. And so I remember back then, like we were selling kind of stuff, second, we were selling some of the secondhand stuff still, some of the old wholesale products that we still had in stock. We bought some stuff at wholesale to, to kind of tide us over and get us moving from the UK. And uh, it was tough. Like, I mean, I remember back then I was making maybe dollars, maybe like 900 to a thousand dollars a month. Uh, okay, to kill, wow. cover everything on my rent was over five hundred dollars, you know, back mm -hmm. then, like uh, to to rent an apartment at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky we were living in a small town where it wasn't that expensive to do that. Um, so you know, we didn't have very much money because we put everything we had into the company and kept rolling everything back in again. And there was definitely a lot of nights where I was kind of lying in bed going. You know, like, when is this going to end? Or when am I going to be, when do I have to go back? And everybody in the job that told me, oh, you're crazy to leave, are going to like look at me and be like, yeah, see, we told you so. So it was definitely a lot of nights like that. But like everything, I think I learned back then, which is really helpful to me, it was from uh, Dale Carnegie. And in his book, um, Stop, uh, uh, was it again? Stop worrying and start living. He says in the first chapter, you've got to live in day tight compartments. In other words, like, don't be thinking too far ahead. Don't think about the past. Live in day, today, uh, take care of today, and tomorrow will take care of itself. And so for a lot of that time as we were transitioning and rebuilding, I was just living day by day. And uh, it really helped because you can control today. And, uh, and that's big. Whereas what we do where we feel fear a lot of times is we are simulating the future and we're not always very good at simulating the future. We're simulating the future based upon our current bias or whatever we're thinking right now. So, so that is, uh, that was very helpful to me still is to this day, by the way. And a lot of people listening, I'm sure you maybe have simulated the future when you're panicking or something like that and you get yourself into a really bad situation. So that was helpful then, but yeah, there was a lot of those times, but we just worked through it and Day by day, brick by brick, we rebuild things. Yeah, it's amazing hearing that because great things don't happen in great increments. They happen in the small, little added up increments after a right. consistent period of time, which your story is a testament to that. And, mm -hmm. and as you start getting that success, you start teaching students. Um, and just for some value for some folks listening, because we've spoken about e-commerce, drop shipping. We've spoken about Amazon FBA, um, private labeling and things like that. Being someone who teaches a lot of, of people how to start their own business and sell on Amazon globally, yeah. what have you noticed as one of maybe the, the biggest uh, obstacles that gets in some people's way from really kind of getting into their personal success? 
Yeah, um, there's a few main obstacles. Uh, I suppose there's like uh, what people believe and also, well, it's all beliefs really. Like, I mean, so a lot of people believe, oh, it's going to be hard or Amazon saturated or something like that. These are usually the things thrown around, but like you can literally knock out the Amazon and saturated thing in like two seconds. And all you got to do is go to statista.com and look at the growth of sales on the Amazon platform over the last number of years. Like whenever we started teaching in 2000, 2015 was when we really like kicked off properly. We just, we were just starting in 2014, you know, in 2015, I believe the revenue of Amazon was about 106 billion and and 2020, because obviously 2021 is not finished yet, and uh, 2020, the revenue is 380 billion, I believe. So like it's, it's four times the size in the time that we started teaching it. But yet when you look at the growth, the growth is still this big, steep uh, incline. So if it's saturated, it, it wouldn't have an incline. It would just kind of like not, like go really slow or flatline or whatever. So the saturation thing is just... Uh, crazy uh, so that was that'd be one of the things then on um, from there it'll usually be around capital and investing money into a business right and i know this because when i started i was like most other people we seem to have this like i don't know where this belief came from but it's like you know well i should invest as little as possible and then i can make loads of money right and i think that comes from just like in fact a lot of us were brought up working our parents were working in many cases and was like a cultural thing that no one really like i love my parents they're awesome people they're they're great and but at the end of the day like you know my parents don't really know how business works they've always been an employee and that's that's cool but like when you're in that situation your whole life then you just don't know how something works. Therefore, you're like, it's probably hard. It's probably a scam, whatever. And so that kind of gets passed down to the next generation. So I had all of that. I just thought, well, oh, putting money into a business is not risky. Oh, selling stuff online is not risky. When really, like when you get into it, you realize it's really not risky when you do the research and you're bringing in the correct products. What, what's risky is I'll just, I'll just sell any old thing and I'll just do a container of it, which would be crazy. Like that's risky. But when you have a, a structured process and someone who knows what they're doing, showing you, it's really not that risky, but you really do have to be prepared to put money into any company. It doesn't matter if you're drop shipping, people have this thing of, well, if I'm drop shipping, I'm never touching the item and I don't have to buy in bulk. You got to buy ads, you know, that's where you're going to, you have to drive traffic some way if you're not using like an Amazon. So there's never a situation in my opinion where you are truly, especially in e-commerce, where there's just no money going to change hands. Uh, and so you've got to get comfortable with the fact that you're going to invest money. You're going to invest a couple of thousand dollars to get yourself established and get yourself moving. And uh, and I think that like traditionally, if you look at say, uh, I live in Wexford, it's a little town. Where, where are you living right now, Ted? I'm in Greenville, South Carolina. You're in South Carolina, right? So yeah. it, it, where you are now in Greenville, like I'm sure to start a cafe in your local town or city, it's like $100,000, $80,000, something like that, right? For maybe more, by the way, depends. Mm -hmm. um, so for those businesses, it's okay to put money into those because it's like accepted. It's what, it's just, that's what you have to do. Like buying a house. Like we put a lot of money down into real estate, even if you're investing in real estate, because that's just what you do. But when you're building a business online, for some reason, people still have it in their minds that, well, it just shouldn't cost anything because it's on the internet. But it's like, no, no, no. You're, you're, you're buying the products, like you're branding them. So that I would say that's probably the biggest obstacle for a lot of people. And so uh, what we find is that we have a lot of younger clients, like Lowe's that are successful. But usually what we find is people who are a little bit older, who've been around for a little while, they really get what we do a lot faster. They're faster to act. And it's simply because they've got capital. They understand I'm not getting any younger here and they've never had the chance to see their money multiply because they've always had expenses. And so when they get this thing of, wow, so if I invest a dollar, when I sell that product, it'll bring me back too. That's exciting. Whereas we've been buying food, gas, whatever, clothes, our yeah. whole lives, we get no returns. So we've taught ourselves money out equals no return. Whereas this is a whole new way of thinking that honestly, Teachers could never teach us anyway because they don't do it. So it's normal. And it's like we have to kind of positively brainwash people when they come into our world. And, um, and that's just how it is.
Yeah, and I think it's when when people finally get that switch in their head. I mean, the opposite is uh, you tell somebody, hey, if you give me a dollar, I'll give you back two. You're probably going to run to the bank and be like, hey, what if I give you 100? (laughs) What if I give you 200? And when you have that eagerness change, I think that's when some of the success really kind of pours into it. Do you think some people, uh, mindset being one thing of, okay, $1 turning to two is not what they're used to, but do you also think there's like the fear too where some people are like, okay, hey, I learned the structure. I learned all this, but you know, for some people, two thousand, three thousand, five thousand dollars is a lot of money, and they have a hard time parting ways with it, even though they know, because yes, business is risky, but so is life. Life is risky. Right. <laughs> yeah. But you think that fear holds them back from really totally. committing to throwing it in? Hundred percent. But I mean, uh, there's a few things on that. Like, let's say you, um, like, I don't know what cell, what cell phone have you got? Like an uh, iPhone? iPhone twelve iPhone 12, right? Guess that. So I've got an iPhone as well. Those phones are about $1,200, 1500 bucks, something like that now. Mm-hmm. You'll talk to most people out there. They have an iPhone, Samsung, whatever, right? So they cost 1000 1500 bucks. They think nothing of that because, yeah. well, I just need a phone. Uh, they've got a car that's worth, you know, 15 grand, 10 grand, 20 grand, whatever. So it's, it's not that people uh, don't have money. It's that people's priorities are out of whack. And so I was the very same, right? So when you realize that, you're like, well, could I, could I drive a car that's not quite as nice and start my company with the, with the balance? And the answer is yes, but only if you're committed. And so what you'll find is that most people, they come into a few situations, they're interested, are interested, but not committed. It's a, a kind of a cliche now, but mm-hmm. it's very true. So, so that's the first thing. And I suppose the second thing, and this is, going to sound a bit harsh for people, but I had to hear this too myself. If, if you do find it hard to come up with $2,000, you got a problem. Something's wrong. Like something is wrong. You don't have skills that are valuable enough to get you more money. You don't have income streams. Like you talked about that are making you money and you're likely putting all into a job that's paying you an amount of money. That's not enough. So that was something that happened to me. I realized, man, I've got to learn how to make more money. I don't have skills that are valuable enough. And so that's what propped me on the journey of learning how to do things like sales, copywriting, and and these valuable skills that uh, make money. And I feel like that's the problem for most of us. We just don't have skills that that are valuable to other people in a way that they'll pay you a lot more for those skills. So for me, if I was giving advice to my younger self now, I would say to that person, Go and get yourself a really great skill like sales or something like that. Go out and make money doing that. Make a nice piece of commission. Take the money that you're making now and invest that into something that can in time become passive. And I feel like that's the problem with a lot of younger people. They're stuck in jobs that pay badly. So get your skills, improve your skills, and then it won't be a problem. And it's like what Kiyosaki says, right? Mm-hmm. If you have 100000 in your bank, let's just say, right? And then an investment comes along and it's $15,000. Well, that doesn't feel too painful because you've got 85,000 left. However, if you've got 15,000 in your bank and someone says it's $15,000 to start some, not that an Amazon business is, that's very scary. Even if it's $8,000, it's extremely scary because most of your capital is now gone. And that is really more of a reflection. Your bank account is a reflection on the value that you're putting out today and the value you're creating. It just is. And so if you're not making the money you want to make, they're the shifts you've got to make, first of all. Yeah. I, I love that answer because I've told my fiance I'm three or four decisions away from being broke. But I'm never going to be poor because I've built a number of skills. And when we talk about, hey, the average millionaire has seven streams of income, the mm. first income is earned income. It's the first yeah. thing you do. And that comes from acquiring skills, improving your ability and your, and your value to others around you. And then yes. that earned income th- can then in turn become something you invest in, whether it be a business or simply just putting into a 401k. And, and for the folks who have that earned income and still think to themselves, well, how can I come up with $2,000? Reassess what you're spending your money on. Like you mentioned, the priorities being out of whack. There, like you, there are people who have the latest technology, the iPhone, the iWatch, and, and the headphones and the Jordans, and yeah. they're like, I can't come up with $2,000. You probably have $2,000 on your feet. <laughs> yeah, and you're probably going on vacation, and this and that and the other, and it's costing, you, it's costing money. And so opportunity cost is an interesting uh, concept, right? And it just basically means that, well, when you do something, you're giving up something else. There's an opportunity cost. And so every time like 
If you're not making the money you want to make and you are spending money on things that are not giving you a return, you are, in fact, you're experiencing a massive opportunity cost. And I think as well, it's tricky because what the internet puts out then, um, and we're in the kind of an interesting time when you're interviewing me now, where, you know, yesterday, I've been very up to date and I don't know when this is going to go out, but yesterday at the time talking today, we had a bit of a crypto crash, right? Yeah. And a lot of people were panicking about the crypto crash. Well, anyway, I'm not going to get into much into that, but that that's an orchestrated crash for people and they're going to all get back in. It's going to move back over again, blah, blah, blah. Point is though, there's a lot of people out there that heard this crypto thing is making loads of money. And so they kind of went in like gambling on it and thinking, this is how I'm going to get rich quick. And that's a problematic thing. You know, uh, we when you are a slave to opportunity like that, you're just like, oh, well, what's the biggest, best thing? How am I going to make the most money possible? You're kind of looking at business like it's a an event, like an event of wealth. So I won the lottery and I made loads of money. I, I put money into this stock and it blew up and I made a fortune. And the media features those kinds of stories. Like, it's so interesting. The media wasn't talking about crypto at all here in Ireland, right? We had a crash yesterday for one day. It's all over the media now. Oh, it's the biggest crash. I'll get out quick and all the rest, right? And so uh, it's the same on the other side. And maybe you watch Shark Tank, something like that. See something, someone becoming really rich or on YouTube, Instagram, whatever. You're seeing all these people making all this money, which seems quick and big. But the reality is that events of wealth you can't rely on them. it's all what you said it's process behind the wealth and and i suppose that's the thing to like i'm doing this 11 years now i'm in business 11 years it's not like one year two years i'm doing it a long time and over that 11 years i've built up a lot of skills just like you said you're building up and i built up money and i've built up you know client bases and all these kinds of things but it took time i started out with nothing and i started out with no following whatsoever so um, I suppose, I hope my story inspires some of you that I'm an 11 year success story. Now, over the last number of years, I've always made money the whole way through. But I suppose in the last maybe three or four years, definitely in the last three years, that's when my wealth has started to really take off. And I've been able to invest in these other vehicles, uh, like crypto and things like that, without the stress because I have capital to do it. I mean, we could do a billion talks about all of those kinds of things, you know, the best way to use money and all that. But, but what I'm really just trying to drill into everybody listening today is, you know, when you see all these outliers that have made money really fast doing this one thing, it's only ever going to be a tiny number of people. And if you really look at the story, there's always a story behind it. The, the person that just finds the idea and becomes rich overnight, I'd say there's like none really when you look at the story, you know? Mm -hmm. I would even I use the story of someone who's like, oh, it took uh, the, the founder of Snapchat when he sold it for two billion dollars mm -hmm. or, or whatnot. And they said, oh, um, he created it. And then three years later was a billionaire. I said, no, he wasn't. He didn't make it in two years. He yeah. he worked for, in tech firms. He he spent yeah. years, almost, I think, a decade in the in the realm before he created this exactly. idea that made him two billion dollars. And you're, you're so right where. A lot of folks live in an instant gratification type world, or I call it the microwave world, where you don't wait till the, the buzzer goes off. It's like one and you yeah. pull it out before the popcorn's done. And, yeah. and so many people try and, and get there that so fast. I love the fact you said process behind the wealth, because I had one of my mentors tell me how a good business has projections. If you can't project accurately or within a range obviously there's going to be some a range of uncertainty but if you can't have a good idea on what your next three or four years are looking like you don't have a business you have a, a dice roll <laughs> and yeah like it's it's true <laughs> but you know that's um that's an interesting point from your mentor as well because uh, what, what age is your mentor in like 50s um well the one that was talking about 45 45, yeah, yeah. So near, near 50, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's interesting because people of that age, a little bit older than me, Robert, my business partner is uh, 45, uh, 46 almost. And um, so so they'd never seen a pandemic before. Remember that too. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, like I always joke like in, you know, uh, January, 2019, well, December 31st, 2019, right? Everyone's doing the New Year's party. This year is going to be my year. This year, it's all going to change for me. And it did change because in March, everything shut down for pretty much a year now. And I suppose that uh, it's interesting in that I, I think the sentiment is right in what the mentor is saying for sure. But I think it's like 
our whole world was definitely shook in the last year because we had this thing that's never happened before. And so what I've actually learned about that for what it's worth is we actually look at 90 days ahead from a, from a planning perspective, like from a tactical perspective. And then we have a direction, like your mentor said, definitely. But I think you have to have both. You have to have a direction, like your mentor said, and then also these kind of 90 day windows. So, you know, you're going along the right way. And then you have to be adaptable enough that if, you know, God forbid another pandemic happens, I'm touching wood and everything I can here. Yeah, uh, you're doing it too. Great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that we're, we're somewhat kind of adaptable to it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Have to have to be able to call the audibles along the way. I do want to use the, the rest of the time we have left, what little time we have left talking about kind of more of the current, because uh, like you mentioned the process and now that our, our, our listeners and viewers have an idea of, of Stephen from 11 years ago to now, and you mentioned the freight company. Um, I'd love to hear kind of the rainbows that are going on now. You mentioned the past yeah. three years, really starting to make the money with the wealth and, and adjust things. What are, what are, in the work right works right now for Steven and what's the future look like in the next few months? Yeah. So like our companies are doing really well. Uh, thankfully, you know, we're, we're projecting about uh best part of $15 million revenue this year uh, across the board, which is great. And then on top of that with a, thank you. With our few Amazon businesses, we operate, we operate with partners now as well. We've invested quite a bit into different partners. We document some of them on our YouTube channel just to inspire people and show them, you know, when you put money in, this is what can happen. One of our partners, Ali, actually, he's just, it's such a joy, you know, because this guy was a, an airport security guard just a couple of years ago. Yeah. And uh, he, he didn't know what he was going to do with himself. But this dude is really smart. He just hadn't got his break yet. And he came to one of our events and we're like, this guy's got something, you know? So uh, yeah, he's been, um, been a partner now for a little bit over a year, year and a bit. And he's on, his business is doing, going to do a million dollars this year in revenue, which is great, you know? And that's yeah. when we've documented that pretty much from the start, which has been really cool. Um, and yeah, like our freight company, as I mentioned at the very start, we're going to ship about 8 million different units this year, which is really, really cool. And so, yeah, we're just continually moving forward. Our community is moving forward. Like our, our our new venture we're moving into is a company called growmyreach.com, which uh, feel free to anyone want to pop over there. We're working with online business owners like... Uh, like a marketplace superheroes type business or software companies, service-based businesses. And one of the things we're doing there is we're teaching them our process for building a promotional system. Uh, pretty much every business that I know out there, they all are good at bringing in new clients, but they're awful at promoting to existing clients and to prospective um, uh, you know, prospects, I should say, on their uh, list. And so we're really teaching people how we've done that. And it's really catapulted our business on to, a massive degree. I think we've grown 200% each year for the last few years now. So that's something that we're, we're starting as well, which is really exciting. And uh, yeah, like, I mean, I make a good bit of money in my businesses, which is great, but I really don't care so much about money as I used to. I'm way more focused on now seeing other people succeed because when other people succeed, I succeed even more. And that's a really big thing. And so even if you're just starting out, uh, it's the Zig Ziglar quote, I think it's a great one. It's, you know, you can, if you help enough other people get what they want, you will we'll get what you want. And that is so true. That's one of the truest things ever. And I would just add to that, when you become a go-giver, not a go-getter, a go-giver, you focus on what can you give to other people, even people who are way ahead of you and you want to work with them. Okay, well, what can you give to these people? What can you, what problems can you solve and package up for people? And that's, that's really the key for, every, for all of us. Yeah. And that's amazing because one of the questions I did write down, I didn't get to ask was, you know, having all your success, what makes you want to start teaching others. But I kind of had that inkling is, you know, when you start to see the possibilities of what others can accomplish, you want to help them do it. And, yeah. and what good is having all this knowledge and, and all these accomplishments if you can't share them. And I love the fact when you talk about increasing the value of someone's audience, because there are so many people who's like, okay, if we want to scale up, we got to get more customers, more customers, more customers. Yes. You're okay. Your average order, order value could be $30 and you're okay, more customers. But how can you increase the value of the customers you already have? Right. Target yeah. them, resell them, maybe package a, a deal with them. Or if you sell a product that has refillable cartridges or something, you, not only do you get the client with the initial purchase, but then you can have the prolonged client for right. the refills, much like the Swiffers yeah. where you have to keep buying those little pads. 
<laughs> right. you're, a, you're a Jay Abraham fan like me. Absolutely. Three ways to grow a business. That's, uh, that's the, it's the best thing ever, you know, for any company, you just focus on that. You cannot go wrong. It's, it's uh, my favorite business philosophy, I would say. Yeah. yeah. I do appreciate the time today, Stephen. And I want to make sure that um, everyone following the podcast can kind of get in touch with you, utilize your course and, and your YouTube channel and learn the amazing amount of knowledge that you're sharing with so many people. So hopefully some of our listeners, as we talk about No Rain, No Rainbows, part of getting out of your storms, a lot of, a lot of these storms can be brought on by money. That's why I want you guys to be financially successful so you can have the life that you deserve and live a life of intent. So Stephen, I'd love to know what links or what call to action folks can follow up and get in touch with you. Yeah. So you can go to marketplace superheroes.com to learn more about the, uh, the Amazon stuff and make sure H E R O E S and heroes at the end. Uh, the other thing you definitely go check out our YouTube channel. Uh, we put a lot of work and effort into that. As you mentioned, that's a great spot to start learning. And then the final thing, uh, if you're an existing business, you want to learn how to grow, grow my reach.com is the other link there. I love that. And I'll have those, um, all those links in the show notes as well. So anyone's Thank listening you. on their, on their app, they can open up the show notes, hit that right away. And they're all ready on those destinations. Steve and I appreciate you guys spending time with us today. I'm going to run down some of the, the tidbits you left along the way, some of your story, just in case some of the listeners, uh, lost it along the way. First, how do I make money? It's a question. Some of us, I'd say most of us have asked ourselves, how do I make money? How can I become valuable? And then you might stumble on a lot of those scams and whatnot. I love how Steven said, I found something that was tangible. I find a product, I sell it to someone, I can see it, I can feel it, and there's full transaction there. And the fact of the matter is an online business, we're so used to spending money for brick and mortar. If I'm going to buy a house, of course, I'm going to spend money. If I'm going to buy a coffee shop, I'm going to spend money. But when you think of an online business, you think of just pulling up a website, there's still capital that's needed because you're still starting a business. Uh, living today, so many of us want to look into the future and if we get scared about what might happen what's going to happen two years from now what's going to happen tomorrow we can't control that focus on today do the best you can and follow those days one by one and you'd be surprised at how those consistent days can lead to something great and build that wall brick by brick as will smith would say and of course money out no return. That's what we've been used to. We're used to spending money and not seeing anything back. But once you learn the process of being able to invest in a business or being able to invest in a process that provides value to someone, you're going to want to pour into that process and into that mechanism, which would be your business, even more to see it grow, see it impact and help more people scale it up and in turn, increase your value. And of course, if you are interested you definitely need to reach out to Steven as he continues to help so many entrepreneurs around the world. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Steven, thank you one more time. And to everybody who made it to the end, we appreciate you. Share this with a friend. If they've been talking to you about starting an online business, if they've been talking to you about selling on Amazon, tell them you know how they can do it globally by sharing this episode. And of course, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. We have new episodes every single week. I wouldn't want you to miss it and leave a rating. Let us know how we're doing. It's the best way we can improve this podcast is by knowing where we need to improve. And if you love it so much, you want to support monetarily, join our Patreon page for as little as $1 a month. You can get some extra audio, extra content, and extra value from guests like Steven and many others. As we always say at the end of the episode, guys, everybody wants the sunshine, but they don't want the rain, but you can't get the pleasure without a little pain. Let's grow.